And we just have to remember to kind of hold back on the preachiness or trying to make people feel badly because they're not doing enough in their mm. personal lives. I mean, that's just not the goal of fiction. <laughs> we just want to yeah. write yeah. a great story and inspire people that way. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast that explores the intersection between science, story, and play Geekoscopy 101 with me, your host, Dr. Yanis Kisten. And today we're exploring the novel genre of eco fiction with writer and author of the dragonfly.eco blog, Mary Woodbury, otherwise known as Clara Hume. Welcome to the show, Mary. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Uh, surviving the third wave here in South mm-hmm. Africa. Uh, how is it where you are? things improving right now they are yes we're going to be opening up our border soon so we'll wait and see how that affects what's going on with covid yeah Yeah, let's hope things get better so tell us a bit about who you are in this moment and what you do mary well my husband and i just moved to nova scotia last year so it was quite a change of life i guess because we moved Mm. from the west coast to the east coast of canada uh smaller kind of more rural area um so that's really kind of changed our lives quite a bit he's because of covid he's um working remotely still he's still working with his team back in vancouver (laughs) um but i haven't started working a job a different job yet so i'm just um but i am a publisher and i do uh, editorial work and book reviews and stuff like that so yeah that's our lives in a nutshell I guess the one big difference is that we have a little bit more property property than we used to have so we have a meadow in the back where we've planted trees that's and nice. have some bees back there and it's really interesting kind of moving to that gardening like lifestyle one with nature now yeah yeah kind of <laughs> really embracing the eco if people ask you what eco fiction is how do you explain to them well there's some great drawn out characteristics and traits of eco fiction eco fiction that are actually on my website but i try to just be as concise as possible and say that it's ecologically oriented fiction um and it's so diverse meaning that Uh, Some people think it only has to take place on planet Earth and it has to be realistic, but earlier studies show that it can be speculative and fantastical, so it can be science fiction or fantasy or really any genre, as long as it's one of the focuses of the story is ecological. So I try to just stay short like that and then direct them to my website if they want to learn more mm. about it yeah in, in much more detail what mm-hmm. drew you to to writing uh, in general it started when I was a young girl really I uh, my family I guess pushed us out the doors out to the great outdoors and we you know as kids we were always out there hiking uh, going to forest and rivers and lakes and Um, That combined with my love of reading uh, just naturally sent me in the direction of writing as well. And it's something I've enjoyed all my life. And I've just kind of uh, done this for ages and ages. Although, of course, when I was little, it was just, you know, writing poems for school or something. Whereas now it's Mm -hmm. for um, not only studying literature that that takes place outside or that has is dealing with the natural world but um writing it as well uh, you know i've written one novel one novella and i'm working on a second a sequel to my first novel right now and how did um your your blog is called dragonfly.eco right or at least the website mm-hmm. how did yeah. that come about and how did the, the publication wing come about It started when I had actually published my first novel, Back to the Garden, um, which was a novel heavily inspired, I guess, or motivated by climate change. And at the time, I was trying to figure out what other 
novels are out there that deal with climate change and didn't seem like there were terribly too many back then. It was 2010, uh, or sorry, 2010 when I opened my own press, but when the book got published, it was 2000, the first edition was 2013. So um, there's been a lot of changes in literature since 2013. Um, but the whole idea for me was to start kind of archiving and, and building a database of other books like mine. And um, in the past, it's coming up on its ninth birthday in a couple weeks. <laughs> so uh, there's, you know, that's how it started, but it, it did expand quite a bit. Like instead of just a list, it's been, a very interactive website where uh, I talk with a lot of authors have, you know, starting to do more reviews of other books. Um, I've written a lot of articles, not only for my site, but for other places such as um, Climate Cultures, um, Chicago Review of Books. And, you know, then as you know, because you're on our Discord, we have the Rewilding Our Stories Discord, which is a more interactive way for um, authors and readers to get together and other artists. And even we have a lot of people there who love video games. Um, mm. So we get together and discuss dis different aspects of this kind of literature and art. Why did you choose? Uh... Discord as a, as a platform for community? Uh, I, I was didn't think that Facebook or Twitter would be a good platform because um, they're so wide open and they're not as contained and it's harder to keep organized with discussion there. Uh, the other idea that I had a long time ago was just to do those old school forums based uh, things, but it seems like those are people, I mean, they exist for sure. Um, another idea was Reddit, but I don't really use Reddit that much. Um, and I wanted to also have a place that was semi-private just because yeah. a lot of times, you know, people want to discuss things that aren't completely open like Reddit is. And I just couldn't think of another platform other than maybe Substack. Um, so Discord I was using for gaming anyway, and it seems like it could just be very popular with people. Um, one of the newer platforms I think that a lot of people use. So that's why I chose it. Also, I was talking with Lovis Geyer, who um, helped start this discord with me i know you've talked with her before about her eco fictology uh but she was using it for uh some other purpose i think it was well for her own patrons and also or patreons and then also for um nano uh so mm. i just thought well let's do that let's let's stick with that platform yeah i think i think it works for for people interested in, in writing and discussing important things in a yeah it's, it's much more than contained than other social medias are mm -hmm. um, and it is yeah it does give you a nice sense of community i think um, compared yeah. to other platforms i think as some platforms get more um, popular it just becomes like a fire hose of information and it's not mm -hmm. like contained so the, yeah. I thought that was interesting um I don't know I wouldn't have otherwise thought of Discord as, as a platform for writers to get together so it was quite <laughs> yeah. so quite cool when I when I got in there um so over your time writing for ecofiction and reviewing ecofiction what are some of the major challenges that authors encounter when they're trying to write for things like climate change or or conservation uh, I think the biggest challenge is uh, something that actually came up in a survey that I did um, because I was asking readers and writers of ecofiction some questions about not only the changes in their lives, but what kind of impacts reading other 
ecofiction books had negative and positive ones and um, one of the negative ones was uh, really people just don't want to read a novel that's preachy or uh, is closed-minded or uh, isn't diverse enough and so I think those can be some of the downfalls of writing ecofiction as well um, especially I guess um, if you know we we care so much as writers mm -hmm. and artists and sometimes it's very easy when you're writing to start you don't really want to preach but you start putting too much kind of boring detail in while well, we already have news articles creative nonfiction, and scientific data that we can read to learn about climate change so really fiction or any art has to be uh, a product that tells a story or um, does the story well and we just have to remember to kind of hold back on the preachiness or trying to make people feel badly because they're not doing enough in their mm. personal lives i mean that's just not the goal of fiction <laughs> we just want to write yeah. a great story and inspire people that way mm. and it's also a form of uh, escapism for some people mm -hmm. um, so you don't want to get too too dark with it unless you're in that kind of genre mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes you want to at least show that there's some hope and not everything is just not, you know, apocalyptic. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah, a sad true. thought. Um, it also reminds me of, of a thing I asked a science animator who animates like abstracts for, for scientific papers for scientists. And he also said that it, it, it's so difficult. It's one of the things where scientists just want to throw so much information at at people but people just don't consume things in that format um, in that way like he said it's, it's like less is more you know it's about yeah. creating a story and having an understandable way of people understanding and enjoying the material so mm -hmm. I guess it's a very similar thing you saw it like was it like seven or about eight nine years ago what's mm -hmm. the difference now that ecofiction is more of a uh, kind of put together genre what's the difference between the writing that used to happen before and more contemporary writing are there any differences yeah there are I, uh, I think just like anything genres can evolve and uh, ecofiction actually came about in the 1970s as a terminology but even before then um, people were writing about you know, being out in nature. And I think one of the differences between the old, old kind of nature writing in fiction and the 1970s was that the nature was considered divine and humankind was there to enjoy it. Whereas in the 1970s, it was definitely more issue based because environmentalism was growing. Um, Ecofiction kind of evolved along with the natural history, uh, and, but there were also political issues to take place. And there was, a, you know, kind of a back to the land movement. It was the decade of the first Earth Day. So people were becoming more aware of some of the issues happening on our planet. And there was actually some nonfiction that inspired it, such as uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, uh, you know. John Muir, a lot of Western, I'd say a lot of Western writers, especially. Um, but ecofiction, the way it's grown since the 1970s, is that really does take place around the world. Um, and also there's a, a larger concern for climate change, which since the 1970s, I think actually in 1977, scientists did converge on the fact that global warming was happening but there was a lot of political backlash on it eventually because of the oil companies, um, you know, kind of trying to change the narration because otherwise they're going to go out of business. So, but during, you know, during the time between then and now, I think ecofictions move more towards the modern um, 
you know, climate change is happening, it's way more obvious uh, to everyone. It's just a fact on the ground. And, you know, every year we just, it just becomes more and more obvious. And we have scientific data to back up the fact that it's happening. So I'd say that's probably the biggest, um, probably the biggest change in ecofiction because when it first started, climate change was a newer concept. And I'm not talking about just like natural climate changes, but like human caused climate changes. So Mm -hmm. there's that bigger kind of pressure on humans that are causing this. And it's something that we have to face and try to mitigate as much as we can. And fiction's really um, just all around the world, just really taken off. Well, how would you like the genre to mature going forward into the future? It's kind of curious to me. I I wish I had a good answer for that. I think Mm. it's going to continue along this path of evolution. And uh, authors have always, since the beginning of time, have always incorporated their surroundings uh, for stories. But they've also done a lot of imagination and speculation um, or even developed a speculative fantastical fiction to kind of mirror our own world. And sometimes that extra layer helps us maybe see something that we wouldn't if it was more direct. Um, so I think it's, I think fiction in general is just going to keep on uh, evolving with the times that we're going through. Um, it's hard for me to say what bigger thing will come along other than climate disruption and catastrophe, Mm. which is um, just to me, in my mind, it's like the biggest thing that humankind has to face from here on out. We're all hopeful that it it remains a fiction and uh, the catastrophes don't don't become non-fiction. What I found really interesting when I was going through uh, your site is that you actually designed quite a bit of an MMO called Amalur. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you tell me a bit about that, how it came about? Yeah, I was... (laughs) uh, Well, I I really like playing MMOs quite a bit. Um, And back then I had written, actually starting in the late 90s, I think I had started writing this novel which i never finished and it was about it was set in spain and it was set in early spain um and it was just kind of like a fantasy novel i never finished it but then i realized it would probably be a better game than it would a novel or at least the concepts behind it i've always been fascinated by spain since i was very very young i remember in high school i took a course that was called Spanish culture and it went into the language, the food, the culture. Um, And then I got sort of interested in Basque uh, a lot because it's just Mm. such a tiny little area that's self-contained and um, they have their own language. It's probably the oldest language that never uh, really got affected by outside influence um the culture did get affected by uh roman catholics and you know everything else that was going on in europe during that time Mm. but i thought it would be kind of cool uh to kind of explore that world in an mmo and so i just started developing ideas and i did a lot of research about what kind of mythology and lore that they had and um i was also i think i did this back in 2006 and so I was starting to play World of Warcraft which was at that time um, a brand new exploratory um, universe (laughs) that was a lot of fun just to to run around in and do little quests but I thought it had some problems as far as uh, just being kind of a grindy you know eventually after you get done exploring, um, it's just kind of a grindy game with mm. goals like carrot stick kind of thing. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I don't know. I just uh, I developed that. Comes it like a was all at some point. Sure. Yeah, exactly. It, it stopped being fun and it started being more grindy. And um, I guess I was just trying to think of a way to combine 
my passion for Basque and Spanish mythology, along with what kind of game would this be? It was the development that I did was not programming or any, anything mm. or, you know, visual or drawing or anything. Yeah. It was all just text. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. I wrote this some of it. Have you played Kingdoms of Amina? It's got a very similar name. <laughs> I just <laughs> learned about that this morning because I'm like, I wonder if anybody really? ever used that. Yeah. No, I didn't. Um, I don't think I'll it was based it's, it's on that. It's a really cool game, but it's got nothing to. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with Spain. I think it's it's just yeah. it's fully like fantasy. Yeah, um, I don't but know. But it's if a fun it's, game. Is it still around? Because it. I think it was remastered. Oh, okay. For, for contemporary systems, but I haven't played recently. I played when it came out in 2011 or something. Mm. Uh, but yeah. it's, it's a fun game. Well, what are you playing uh, recently? Uh, the play? most recent game I played is World of Warcraft, but I actually i kind of boycotting that with a lot of other Blizzard uh, yeah, fans because of... Yeah, debacle, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not really Sick. playing anything right now. Um, occasionally, we play Valheim, which is uh, okay. based on a Viking, like a Viking lore. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hard to solo some of the bosses, so whenever we do play, we just kind of build houses and wait for our friends to come along and help <laughs> us kill them. I, I always like playing games where you build stuff, but I don't like being attacked. I just want a yeah. game where you just like build a thing and just like you don't have to worry, like look over your shoulder every two minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I dig like civilization and stuff, but once like people start attacking me, then I kind of get bored and just start a new map mm -hmm. over again and start building up. <laughs> um, so. Overall, with your experience in, in ecofiction writing, what tips would you have for aspiring ecofiction uh, eco writers? writers? Uh, going back to that whole thing, try not to be preachy uh, to your audience mm. and try to be, try to look at this fiction. Uh, I know a lot of us writers are kind of privileged and like I live in an area where if now, if I would have been back out on the West Coast, I would definitely say they they're being very affected right now. But the, there's so many wild wildfires and just crazy heat back there. Like my mother-in-law lives in Kamloops, which is in the interior of British Columbia. They're getting temperatures up to like 50 and over Celsius, which is just unheard of. Jeez, Louise. In yeah, That's wild. I know. And it's like, you know, here on the East Coast, we uh, occasionally, well, we've only been here for a little over a year, so I can't really say, but um, this summer it's been cool and rainy. We've been really lucky that we haven't had any uh, climate catastrophes, I guess. Um, so when I write, I, I just have to really imagine like some of the worst things that could happen because I'm not experiencing them myself right now. Although, mm -hmm. you know, I lived in Vancouver for eight years and every year the droughts and the heat waves just got worse and worse. And this year they're really bad. So anyways, I, I think other than trying not to be preachy is just also trying to, um, trying to realize that the world that we're building uh, if we're going to tackle issues, environmental issues, and not just climate change, but any kind of ecological disruption of any kind, that we have to open our minds to how people are experiencing this around the world um, and kind of go with that. It's, it's not going to, I mean, realistically, no, it is probably apocalyptic and dystopian to a degree. But like you said earlier, it's nice to have some kind of hope, you know, we don't want to read <clears throat> constant dark things. I mean, if we wanted to do that, we would just doom scroll through the news, you know. Um, fiction has to re reach other people's hearts, good and bad, in order to really inspire. So I think even in the face of dystopia and bad things, that we can write Usually, I, I think it can come in, come in the shape of characters in 
the book that actually do positive things to um, counteract some of the tragedy that we're seeing around the world. So that'd be another piece of advice is just make something good happen, you know? And I, I think because people react to other people who are going through things that it's, it, you know, as readers, we can be drawn to feel a lot of empathy, that that's a really good way is to have characters that people can relate to and to get inspired by. For sure. Have some positivity in your apocalypse. Mm -hmm. It's the take yeah. on this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Mary, for joining me. It's been a really fun chat. Uh, why don't you let the viewers know where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure. Uh, the dragonfly dot eco which is an actual dom domain name is the site where i curate all these uh eco fiction books and then i also write under pen name clara hume and you can find my books and some of the other projects like uh the the mmo at dragonflypub.ca cool thanks again for joining and cheers yeah, thank you so much for having me.